ladies and gentlemen, tonight I thought we'd have our own wee revolution, okay? So are you up for that? Great. This is the nature of the revolution. I want, by the end of this evening, you to understand why what I'm doing now is so important. And what I'm doing now is I'm trying to encourage you all to hold up a drop of water before your eye and to look through this water as a lens onto the world. I'm going to try and explain why looking through this drop alone tells you a great deal about our world and about its future. I'm probably going to harangue you slightly. I might even make you stand up and do silly stuff occasionally, and if you're not comfortable with that, please just give me one of those faces which suggests you'd rather I'd move away from you. Um, and there will be questions and answers at the end of it, so don't worry, it won't just be me shouting at you. And can everyone hear me? Great. So, here's the thing. Why is it that when we think of water, we quite rarely think of the reserve, the, the beauty, the magnificent thing that is in here, but when you ask people about modern water, they quite rapidly think about war. I spent two years writing a book about our relationship to water, and everyone says to me, oh, we're going to have a water war. And I say, okay, now? And there's this sense of, well, not now, but I'm telling you we're going to have a water war. So I thought it might be the best way to describe this, to try and explain to you why a water war may or may not happen, okay? Now, let's start off with some simple stuff. If everyone could stand up, who feels physically comfortable with that? If everyone would like to stand up, I need to narrow you down. I need to whittle you around. So I need to diminish you to a very small group. So everyone can sit down who uh, is, likes a drink of beer. How are we doing? OK. Uh, everyone can sit down who isn't a teetotaler. Oh, dear. Hard luck. Sir, what's your name? Anon. Anon. How you doing? I'm Alex. Nice to meet you. Hi. Anon, would you like to just step forward with me? You can come back to your chair. There won't be any embarrassing things done to you beyond the fact that people will stare at you. <laughs> Anon represents some of our water problem. <laughs> In a nice way. Anon, where are, you, where are you from in the world? Edinburgh. You're from Edinburgh. Yeah. So in which case, all the better, because you're obviously Scottish, and therefore Annan is one of the lucky ones. He sits in a soaking wet land, which naturally traps water and has a vast excess of it. But the way the world is is this. Annan alone, amongst all of this audience, represents the people in the world who have access to a surplus of water. The rest of you, and I'm sorry for making you feel so bad so early in the evening, the rest of you represent the rest of the world. Lots of you in places where the water is running out, okay? So we've got to bear this in mind, that it's as brutal as this on one level. Just one lovely man from Edinburgh versus the rest of you, okay? Now, there's something very odd about this, because water is essential to life. We all know this. We don't get through a day without water. So why on earth would we arrange it that Annan alone has got it all and the rest of you are running out? That makes no sense. So let's try and explain why that is. Annan, you can go and sit down. Thank you very much. I, I'm <laughs> if Annan doesn't leave in the interim, he will be back because he's, he's about to represent the United Nations in about 20 minutes. <laughs> Brace yourself for that, Anna. Now, let's try and explain some very simple basic background history, OK? So let's now imagine that this glass of water is, in fact, the planet Earth, OK? We're going to whiz through about 2,000 years of history, uh, 20,000 years of history, rather, but I'm going to try and do it as quickly as possible. This is the Earth, and this is the Sun. So the Earth, as we all know, moves in an ellipse around the Sun. And we also know that it's not entirely perfect. The Earth kind of wobbles as it goes round, like a drunk man on a Friday night making his way home. He will get there, but it won't be exactly elegant. Now, the lack of this elegance, if you like, means that the surface temperature of the Earth switches at quite regular intervals. It's about 100,000-year intervals, OK? 
And what's happened is that 20,000 years, the Earth switched from a cold period to a warm period. This is very important because we have never known civilization when the planet's been cold, when the water is locked into the ground, into the caps, when it is so fixed that there is little rain because the water's in ice. We have never known civilization in those times. But civilization obviously did come. Ballpark, I'm obviously being very broad here with my history, but about 6,000 years ago. Sir, would you like to be an early man? <laughs> uh, you obviously look like a very fine late man and mid man, but would you like to stand up and be an early man for me? Would that be okay? Standing up. Standing up, would you mind? Sure. And what's your name, sir? Alistair. Alistair. Alistair represents mankind. You can tell. And what a fine specimen. But up until about 50,000 years ago, Alistair was a bit stupid. Um, don't take it personally, don't worry, things are going to change. Um, he was Homo erectus. Now I'm, again, being very broad here, but essentially his brain isn't that big. But about 50,000 years ago, all of our brains suddenly get a lot bigger. We acquire the imagination that can manipulate an iPod that can work out why bankers are stupid. We get this big brain. And it's a very sad thing, it seems to me, because we get it for 30,000 years, we're locked in an icy world. But then the world turns to our favor. And so suddenly, from 20,000 years ago, Alistair begins to change the world around him, to make it more suitable to him. He begins to find crops which he can turn into grass. He begins to develop farming. But the big break for Alistair is when he arrives in southern Iraq. You're smart. You're in southern Iraq and you're standing on the soil, and you're planting your grass seeds. Would you like just to, to do that for me? That's good. That's good. I picked the right man. Yes, exactly. Recently. Alistair's grass seeds are before us. But unfortunately, to this side of him is the Euphrates, and to this side of him is the Tigris River. And the Euphrates and the Tigris have a habit of flooding. And so before us, Alistair, your lovingly nurtured crops are destroyed. You are obviously briefly quite sad about this, but you then make a very important decision, Alistair. You decide to begin to control that water. You build dikes at the edge of the river. You build ditches and canals which bring the water into your fields. What you do is you invent irrigation. It's a small thing. It's no more than a ditch. But with that ditch alone, Alistair breaks the cycle of being dependent on the luck of nature and begins to get some kind of control over nature. What he gets control over is the water. What that means is that Alistair is no longer dependent on his crops, possibly flooding or not. He gets to guarantee there might be a surplus of food. Alistair, you can sit down and enjoy yourself because you've got a surplus of food. It's from these irrigation ditches, from this surplus of food, that we begin to get civilization, what we call this way of living. We get the first sustainable cities. The earlier cities, Jericho or Katal Hayok in Turkey, they fail because their water systems aren't reliable. But here we've got a reliable water system. So we get the great city of Ur, 50,000 strong. Then what do we get with that? Well, we get bureaucracy. The first right written records that we have refer to the flow of water through those irrigation ditches and the surplus of food that is created. With bureaucracy, we obviously then get politics. We also then get religion. Religion, food, and water deeply connected. It is the temples that store the surplus of food. And we get something else very important. In the wider irrigation ditches, we get a means of transporting that food from place to place, so the hungry can be fed. Up until that point, the best you could do was on the back of a donkey. That's not enough to cure a hunger or a famine. Now, I'm being broad here, but you're accepting the broad point, which is that civilization emerges from the control of fresh water. But that doesn't explain why we immediately think of wars.